I want to thank everyone again for joining us today, and I will begin by introducing the director for the Institute for Neuromedicine, Medicine, Dr. Nancy Klimas. Dr. Klimas is the Dean of Research and Professor of Medicine at the Dr. Kiran C. Patel College of Osteopathic Medicine and Chair of the Department of Clinical Immunology at Nova Southeastern University. In partnership with the Miami Veterans Affairs Medical Center's Gulf War Illness Research Program, the INAM is a multidisciplinary research and clinical institute that takes a systems biology approach to understanding complex medical illnesses, such as myalgic encephalomyelitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, and Gulf War illness. Dr. Klimas is Professor Emeretta at the, at the University of Miami's Muller School of Medicine, a diplomat of the American Board of Internal Medicine, a diplomat of a diplomat in diagnostic laboratory immunology and director of clinical immunology research at, my, at the Miami Veterans Affairs Medical Center. She has achieved national and international recognition for her research and clinical efforts in multi-system disorders, including MECFS and Gulf War illness. She is the past president of the International Association for CFS and ME and a past member of the Health and Human Services CFS Advisory Committee. I will now hand it over to you, Dr. Klimas. Well, thank you, Sarah, and thanks everybody for attending this conference. Um, you can hear me okay? Everything's good? Yeah, perfect. Great, super. So uh, for those of you that are new to this conference, this conference has a tradition. And the reason why we do this is to thank the many Gulf War veterans who have served not once, but twice. First to serve their country, of course, uh, when your military service and in the Gulf War, but second to serve your fellow veterans all over again by participating in research that tries to get to the answer of this miserable illness and move us into therapies that could be effective. We can't do this without you and your volunteerism. And to me, this is straight out patriotism to do this all over again when you're not feeling well and, and making this huge effort to uh, participate in the, in the work that the various researchers are doing to try to get to the answers and get solutions for you. So thank you. This is basically a thank you conference. But let me tell you, um, my, my job is to do a quick review of the work that we're doing at the Institute here, at the Institute for Neuromu Medicine, which is a collaboration between uh, Nova Southeastern University and the Miami VA uh, research program. And, um, and I'm gonna give you a, a quick update. I've done this uh, presentation before, so some of the slides will be familiar, but mostly they're there. They'll tell you what we're up to. So anyway, here at the Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine, um, we're a big group, I don't think you might realize, but we are actually, um, we started uh, 10 years ago, though frankly, we've been doing Gulf War work a lot longer. So we gathered a group of Gulf War illness investigators from many different universities and we home based from Nova Southeastern University. And we have, I think 17 faculty and 50 or so uh, people all together working on this, which is very exciting. So it's a great big group. I think we are the largest group in the country. And, and that didn't work. Devil. I'm sorry, give me just a moment. I am having technical difficulties. Is this working now? Yes, finally. All right, and this is a long list of people that you don't have to read, but you can see the point of this is that we have systems biology, we have laboratory science, we have animal modeling, we have clinical trials, and we have clinical care all, all enveloped in this one great big research group that is really cool because we can take things from clinical observation back to the basic scientists to explore what the mechanisms are, have them work out the mechanisms, uh, have the computational scientists work out models that give us new therapeutic directions, then test that in animal models and bring it all the way forward into the, into the clinic again so that we actually are doing the trials. It's, it's a one-stop shopping kind of place and it's exciting. In this session, I'm I get to open things. I'm gonna talk about a little bit what we're doing and why we're doing it. Obviously, this is an audience that doesn't need to know what is Gulf War illness, but it is a miserable illness. And we've spent a great deal of time, all of us in the world, not just our group, trying to get at the causes. And at this point in time, because it's been 31 years, it's, it's more about what's causing it to persist than necessarily being able to focus down on what caused it to start. Though, honestly, there's quite a bit of work that 
that points right at the, the military toxic exposures at the time of the of the Gulf War, the very mixed bag of many toxins, but including organophosphates and the oil well fires and pesticides and so on. There was a, a, it was like a perfect storm of toxic exposures during the during the inciting events that started um, the process. Then we'll talk about um, what we're doing and uh, the diagnosis. Uh, that we, this mainly because you are again, people that have helped us with our research, you understand that when we're trying to understand Gulf War illness, we have to define it in some way so that we are treating the people or studying the people that have the illness. Sometimes that makes the case definition a little tight. Sometimes people are upset because they can't get in the study because they have something like say uncontrolled diabetes or something else going on that would make it very difficult to sort out what's what. But um, I think that you can appreciate that um, in science, you gotta sort of draw the smaller circle to understand the bigger circle. So that's what um, pretty much we have to do. But it's an illness that is um, across multiple systems with many, many different symptoms. And, and as I say, it can be very disabling. What do we know about the cause? Well, we know a lot about the cause that the neurotoxins uh, seem to play a key role, particularly the pesticides, organophosphates. In the animal models um, of the disease, they've really focused in on using organophosphates and sarin as the, as the um, inciting agent, but it's uh, a little more complicated than that, uh, even in the animal models. Uh, and that we've, there's been a lot of work on risk, on genetics of risk, and these seem to circle around detoxification patterns. It makes sense if one person in three remained ill after their exposures to these toxins in the Gulf War, that perhaps there's a genetic factor that makes about one third of the population more vulnerable. And that would seem to be the case that the, the ability to detoxify some of these toxins is slow in some people normally, but if you put them in a really intense exposure, they're more likely to get over that threshold into the point of illness and, and to chronic illness. And then, uh, as I said, we're really focused down more on illness persistence at this point. Is there some way that we can change the course of this illness that has persisted for 30 years? Our research would say, yes, you can. So that's exciting. And um, we're not the only people working. If you pull up clinicaltrials.gov and just put in the keyword Gulf War illness, you will find that there's 61 trials listed, 61, 15 currently recruiting. So there's a lot of work going on in Gulf War illness. Um, and it's been well-funded in large part because of the advocacy of the veterans with this illness to go back to Congress again and again and again and said, I'm still sick, please pump money into this field until there's an answer. And, and honestly, none of this work could be happening if the advocates hadn't worked so diligently to make sure that this did not become the forgotten illness. This is just a screenshot of a clinicaltrials.gov webpage. I just wanted to show you how easy this is. You can go to that webpage, key in Gulf War, kick a button that says actively recruiting, and then you'll come up with these, the names of the trials that are currently going on. And it's, it's a law that says, if you accept federal funding, you have to be on trials.gov. So this is a pretty solid, comprehensive list. So. Uh, be aware. So what is the focus of the work? Well, a lot of the work is on the inflammation involved. Now, no surprise to you with Gulf War illness that there's inflammation involved within Gulf War illness. You feel like it, right? Your body feels like it's inflamed. And so does your brain. And when you look at the studies, you're dead on. If I listen well with my doctor ears and I say my patient says they have a lot of inflammation, you shouldn't be surprised that when we pull out our fancy tools that we find that inflammation. But it is actually pretty cool that you can look at the brain. This is some work that was done by Jim Baranek and, um, and Dr. Al Shell that, that showed um, using imaging scans that focus on straight up inflammatory markers in the brain that there is indeed demonstrable, measurable, abnormal inflammation in the brain. So. That's important, it gives us a focus. Um, and of course, our group is very engaged in this. In fact, Dr. Nathanson and our group is working with Dr. Baranuk in, the, in these studies and is doing a lot of the genetic transcription 
and immune regulation work that um, was trying to explain the underpinnings of this inflammation, what cells are doing what and what regulates them so that there might be a hope to turn something off that's been turned on and try to quiet down the brain. We also have studies going on that follow the work of um, Dr. Abudanya and Dr. Sullivan uh, that look at autoantibodies in the brain. And we've taken that bench work all the way to clinical trial. And we have a study now for people that have brain autoantibodies, it's just to say antibodies that are attacking specific areas of the brain uh, using the kinds of treatments used in rheumatology that quiet antibody production. So we have a very exciting study there that I'll talk about in a little bit um, that's again, focused on brain inflammation as a target for intervention. Um, we just finished this CoQ10 study. Uh, was, we had ridiculous uh, problems with recruitment. I can, it's a theme that you're gonna hear is that everything about research in Gulf War illness, the rate limiting step right now is always recruitment, finding enough study subjects for the studies. Without the study subjects, it just can't go on. And this study that I thought we could finish in two years took us four years to fully recruit. That was finished right before uh, COVID or right at the tail beginning of the COVID. So well, you can't blame COVID for the lousy recruitment though it, it sort of did screw us up a little bit because we were still recruiting when it started. But um, anyway, the long and the short of it is this study is finally done. We've spent a solid year since the close of this study um, analyzing all of the data um, and getting all the biologic markers uh, analyzed. And it's finally, finally coming together. All those analytes are in a data set right now. And we hope to be writing this paper in just the next few weeks. So very exciting that we're finding to the point where we can um, uh, present the results. Unfortunately, I can't present it today because you're not allowed to talk about your results before you put the paper in. It's sort of a, one of those rules for publication. And I apologize. I wish I could tell you more right now but you'll know in very short order. Um, another, that this CoQ10 paper is coming off the, the heels of a lot of oxidative stress work. Um, oxidative stress is when your body in trying to make energy should be able to clean up the, the byproducts of energy production, which are called free radicals. But when they fail to, these free radicals build up in the cells and actually really muck up the ability of cells to function correctly and can even destroy the cell and can be the source of inflammation if the cell actually dies. So dead cells, particularly in the brain, drive neuroinflammation. So oxidative stress is a key feature of what is going on um, in MECFS, both in the body and in, I mean, in Gulf War illness, in both the body and the brain. Um, uh, and of course, we're really focused on the brain because um, the brain regulates the entire uh, body systems. So, but treating oxidative stress becomes a really key feature and using antioxidants that cross the blood brain barrier is very important. As it happens, CoQ10 doesn't cross the blood brain barrier that well. It's better for the body than it is for the brain. And so there's a lot of work trying to find things that do cross. And we're doing a study with liposomal glutathione. It does cross curcumin, it does cross. Uh, the Ross Camp Institute is in the closing year of this study uh, that you'll hear about shortly because they'll be speaking. Um, and um, as you can see, and these aren't the only studies that look focused on antioxidants or using uh, antioxidant combinations. Uh, Beatrice Gollum has a good study underway. Um, we have a, several studies that we'll be talking about that actually I get to talk about in a moment. That will, uh, there we go. So um, this is one, the liposomal glutathione curcumin study. We're in the final month of recruitment of this study and we were anxious to get another couple dozen, well not a dozen, about a dozen more people in. <clears throat> and um, it's an easy study. It's a virtual study at this point. You don't have to come in to be in this study. If you could reach, if you're anywhere in the country, you can be in this study. And um, it's looking at whether or not liposomal glutathione or curcumin versus placebo uh, helps uh, people with Gulf War illness. And we do a lot of biologic workup with blood work that we have um, drawn by the local Quest Lab. So uh, it's something that we've managed thanks to COVID to adapt our protocol design so that you don't have to be in South Florida to participate. Oh, there we go. So, um, 
The other thing that is a focus of clinical trials is whether you can de improve these detoxification pathways. One of the things in Gulf War illness, yes, you were poisoned initially. Why would you still 30 years later be sick from this kind of poisoning? Well, the fact is that there's a lot of poisons in your day-to-day -day existence. And if you're a poor detoxifier, if there's ways to improve your ability to detoxify the pesticides that are being sprayed in your office, in your homes, that the mycotoxins that are in your foods and in the mold in your environment and so on, all these things are things that can further trigger or continuously trigger the kind of neuroinflammation in Gulf War illness. And so some of these studies are looking at ways to improve detoxification. And uh, Dr. Grant recently uh, com completed this study, and this is a paper that he's now published looking at um, whether or not you can look at the number of exposures people, if there's a biomarker, a way of sort of having a yardstick in the body to look at how many times your, 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 your body's been dinged by toxins. And he has a way of looking at the DNA itself and the DNA repair mechanisms as a measure of uh, detoxification. And he was able to show actually that this evidence that there is a chronic insult because the, the body's work to try to repair DNA in Gulf War illness is upregulated in a chronic way. Every single day, there's more DNA repair than would be normal, uh, was shown in his study. It's an exciting study and it shows, which is kind of cool, that your body's trying to repair itself, which is wonderful. It's better than sitting down and saying, you know, I'm done. <laughs> if your body is working hard to try to get better, that's very good news. Um, there's a lot of work on hormones and hormone regulation, again, and the brain is involved in an illness and then neuroinflammation, oxidative stress in the brain is involved, then the regulation of normal hormones is going to be affected because that's a brain function. The hypothalamus and the pituitary gland are up there working hard to try to keep everything in a normal balance and it gets off kilter. And so basically all of the hormones in the body can be a little knocked off. The thyroid hormone, the adrenal gland, the... Um, testosterone levels or estrogen levels and so on. In our studies where we try to understand the interaction of all these different systems together in a computational model and a computerized model of, of what's going on, this neuroendocrine balance is a critical feature of why people stay ill. And in the study that we have going on that we've nicknamed the reboot study where we're trying to reboot all these pathways back to normal, um, um, we actually manipulate the hormone balance to try to reboot uh, the neuroendocrine system and the brain back into a normal balance. Uh, Dr. Segarra is doing a, a study using growth hormone. This is an animal model study, but he's got some early uh, data that's looking promising. And so uh, he's excited about this. He's got a bunch of mice with Gulf War illness modeled mice in the in the cages right now, receiving um, these growth hormone uh, antagonists to see if they can uh, affect the way their brain and growth hormone affects um, healing in the body. We do a lot of work uh, looking at men and women uh, and whether or not there are differences between men and women. Surprise, yes, there are. Bigger surprise, yes, there are even in the models of treatment. And so in the current reboot study, it's a, it's a male model of Gulf War illness. So it's a men's study. Um, but we have another model for women that we're just submitting actually this week again for, um, for funding to try to move the female model into clinical trials as soon as we can. And she, that's being submitted as a VA merit um, in the next few days. So that's exciting. And so uh, we have this study going on. Now this woman study that we've been doing, uh, it's a really cool study. We did it with men. This is what gave us this amazing reboot model that we're, we're, we're testing. And then we redid the whole study again for women. The only thing we need now in the women's study is more female controls in their 50s and 60s that are willing to come in and have bloods drawn during a bicycle ride so that we can get a better normative data for the female model. We have pretty much what we need um, in, the, in the men's model. It's done and we already moved all the way into, through the mice and all the way into human trial. And we're on our second male human trial, but we have not yet been able to move the women's study 
uh, for the two clinical trial, we still need a few more um, controls. So if you're in the South Florida area and you have some women friends that they don't have to have been deployed, they just have to be of the same age and veterans, it would be great if you might encourage them to volunteer for these studies and help us better understand the differences between healthy and sick in, um, in these illnesses. Um, and then speaking of women, uh, Lou Bob Nathanson has spent a lot of time trying to work out um, the female models of this illness uh, at a genetic level at which genes are being turned on and off and what's regulating them. And she's doing some great work. She's really stretched to find uh, the study subjects. And if again, any woman veteran goes to any of the bee brain sites, you'll be hearing more about that. Um, we would have better access to the samples that we need. Of course, we're recruiting men and women for bee brain in South Florida. This is a biorepository that, that feeds the research all over the country, many, many investigators. And uh, if we could just get more women to volunteer for that study, we would have a lot more answers for the women veterans that were there and are suffering. So I, I alluded to this reboot study where we're um, trying to um, understand homeostasis. And I've told you that we've finished in the men's study all the work we need to understand the model and pushed it through the animal model. We cured a bunch of mice, cured. Did I use the word cure? Oh, yes, I did. I used the word cure. We cured the mice of their Gulf War illness, even though they were the equivalent of chronically ill, 10 years ill in this model of the mouse. I'm using the drugs that we are now using in a clinical trial um, for Gulf War illness. We just finished our first little phase one study on this um, and uh, trying to use the lowest possible doses of these two drugs uh, together in the lowest amount. Now we've moved it into a second phase where we're using the medication for three months instead of one month. And um, it's a study where we, we basically reduced brain inflammation with one medicine for three months. And then we reboot the neuroendocrine pathways with a different medicine for one week. And then we step back and watch and see what happens over the next um, four months. So it's a really cool study. We're recruiting it right now. And I mean, we really need study subjects because this study was delayed because of COVID. The second, the second study, the one that we're recruiting right now, um, we had to wait until uh, vaccines were widely available before we could initiate a study that reduces inflammation. We were worrying, of course, that um, if we did that during COVID, that we might, might keep, put people at greater risk for a more serious infection. And so we had to wait until people were vaccinated before we could restart the study. And now everyone's vaccinated. And now we're at a really good spot uh, with COVID where the variants are not as severe. And we are uh, very excited to be back in the saddle and, and getting these studies together. But that delay cost us a lot. We are funded to do a phase one and a phase two. That means we're funded to get this from this little study that proves the point and picks the right dose to the great big study that's a multi-center study across the whole country. And we're funded to do that right now, but we have to finish the entire lot, get it all done in the next two years. That means we have to fully recruit this phase one study in just in the next couple months at best, I mean, ideally in the next few weeks so that we could have all that data, that six months of data all analyzed by the fall and institute our phase two study before the end of the year. And uh, that is our goal. It's a really ambitious goal. It's gonna be really hard to get that phase two study done if this phase one isn't recruited almost immediately. We need 17 people. So think about that. We do have some, not tons of travel money, but we have some travel money to support that. And we are, doing this study in South Florida. Like I say, this is our moonshot, go for the cure study where, where we are very, very excited. The most exciting thing I've ever done in my entire career is this study. So I would really um, hope that y'all hear me say, please volunteer for this study. We need, we need study subjects. Um, well, another thing that we do, and this is really important for you to hear, I told you before that we have to narrow sometimes the, the case definition to be able to do good work, but we're really cognizant that, that it's not true that people, the military the veterans often come out of service with more than one thing going on. Sometimes they have PTSD, sometimes they have TBI, sometimes they have 
Gulf War illness, sometimes they have depression, they have all these different kinds of things going on. And you don't want to, to do a study that's so narrow that you can't generalize and help everybody or as many people as you can. And so we don't really want to overdo that. Instead, we, we, we just acknowledge it's complicated, really, really complicated. And thus you need supercomputing, hotshot, amazing scientists like, like Dr. Craddock and Dr. Broderick that have done these amazing computational modeling work in, our, in, in the field. And right now, Dr. Craddock has just completing and, and, and has another study underway that's really teasing out PTSD, TBI, depression, men, women, all the different um, subgroups, if you would, to try to get models of treatment that makes really good sense for the individual. And hopefully it's gonna to get to the point where you can model it down to a, a single individual, where you can put in all the complexities and as much knowledge as you have and let the supercomputer drive uh, answers that um, seem very sci-fi, but oh my goodness, it's true. And it's really doing amazing things. And you can see that here's Dr. Kranich's um, um, different studies that he has underway. And he's got studies for TBI, he's got studies for PT PTSD. He's looking at men versus women, women with and without PTSD. He had a paper out today on women with PTSD that said that, wow, the PTSD is um, really enters into the complexity of the illness and actually um, changes the way we, we sort of analyze and model that you cannot explain Gulf War illness on any kind of mood or anxiety or PTSD overlay that Gulf War illness is an entity in and of its own right. So that's a really important um, thing, observation. And, and uh, we knew that it's going to matter to the men and women with Gulf War illness that they see the illness as not something that is um, psychiatric per se, if you would, but rather something that is um, even deeper rooted than, than that. This is the reboot study that I was talking about that we need 17 people right now, right now, call this number right now. We really, really need to recruit this study in, in order to be able to deliver the goods for you. And like I say, this is our moonshot go for the cure study. And um, we couldn't be more excited about the potential of this study. I don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to whip through this part. But this is to say in the that in, when you're dealing with studies that are, um, as, or with illnesses as complicated as Gulf War illness, you, you can't get your too narrow a view. You can't say, oh, this is a brain illness or that this is a, a, a immune system illness or that this is an endocrine illness because it's all of that. And, and those systems lean heavily into and on each other. And until you try to understand this illness as homeostasis, the way these illnesses interact and balance each other, you really can't get at the answers. And so when the, the, um, Dr. Craddock and his team look at the different types of um, modeling of this illness, um, and they're trying to say that when you're healthy, all these illnesses sort of are in a balance and your, your, your body is in this little well here. When you're sick, you crawl up this wall here, but you always roll back into wellness. But something magical happened during a golf wellness, something magically bad that rolled you up over this mountain and rolled you into this other well. So now you're in a different space and now you're balanced there and you crawl up the well, you almost get better. You crawl back down, boom, slam down, or you get sick with the flu, you get sicker, even sicker, but then you get fall back into your old, but now sick chronic balance. So what this um, moonshot is, was using the supercomputer to find ways to crawl up the right mountain and fall back into the right hole of wellness. That would be, that's the best way I can describe it. And to do so, you had to push more than one button. You couldn't just make the endocrine system better or adjust the immune system better. You had to push multiple buttons in the right order to, to basically reboot the system back into its balance. And so they did, you know, using supercomputing platforms, hundreds of thousands of trials in silico, in the computer, in every kind of combination, at every kind of dose, hitting every kind of button, and trying to create this complex model that was developed into this rebooted model of normal. And it basically, um, it resulted in this first design, the one that we're testing now, and the one that cured all those mice, which was that we had to reduce brain inflammation 
with a specific type of drug and then block the adrenal gland briefly so that the adrenal gland screamed out to the brain to turn back on and produce the signaling that would normally drive a normal adrenal function and then release it by taking that drug away, sort of like, like you know, revving your engine and then taking the chucks away from the, from the wheel. So you're just speeding out and then um, rebooting the normal adrenal axis. And that's what um, we believe we can do in our first study, the lower dose, lower exposure study, we almost got there, we were, we were close. We moved the needle in the, in the predicted and right direction and people did feel better, but we didn't quite cure them. So now we're doing this second study where we're hoping that we can take it all the way. So this was the deal. We put people on these bikes and measured everything. A whole lot of bloods were drawn in, in rapid succession so we could understand what relapse was being driven by. Gave all that data to the guys in the supercomputing. Okay, so the two quick things I wanted to say, I don't know why that cut off my slides when I was talking. Two important things. The Gulf War Illness Clinical Trials Consortia is an ongoing effort. It's a national consortia. It's got multiple sites and we're just kicking off the studies. We had a very long COVID delay. And I think that you're gonna hear this theme a lot. And perhaps as people that have been involved in our clinical trials, you just don't know what COVID did to research in this country, not to Gulf War illness per se, but to all research. We all got put on a hard stop when COVID hit this country, the pandemic, because it was considered risky to even bring you into our sites to, it was your hospital-based sites to, um, to be evaluated. So now finally after vaccinations and after this pandemic has run much of its course, let's pray, the, um, we're back up and running and things are going again. And we're so anxious not to lose any ground and lose the momentum that we had. It was so important that you, the, vet, the, the veterans who've been waiting with, you know, impatiently, appropriately so, for answers, need to know that we're on this and that this is going forward. And so the Gulf War Illness Clinical Trials Consortia has one study up. It's that reboot study I was referring to. We need to recruit it, please volunteer. We're gonna be starting a second study that's entirely virtual. So it's got a nat national uh, reach. People who are nowhere near our sites can participate in that study. It's going to be the Bacopa study. Then there's another study called the NAC study, the N-acetylcysteine study, which is all about that oxidative stress stuff I was talking about. That study is going to be um, also national with a national reach, but with regional um, emphasis because some of the sites will be doing imaging. So that's very exciting. So all this stuff is going on and you need to hear about it. And of course, the consortium is also supporting a number of other trials. Um, and I don't have time to review it all with you, but I, but I do want to uh, make sure that you are aware of it. Um, sorry. Um, and the B cell depletion study I mentioned ever so briefly, but this one we aren't allowed to do because of COVID, the drug that we would have used would have put people at risk. So instead we switched it to an IV gamma globulin treatment to reduce autoantibodies. This study is finally approved, ready to go up and running, very exciting for people that have autoantibodies that are targeting their brain. And we have a screening tool for that. This was the heels of Kim Sullivan's study that demonstrated that these autoantibodies exist. And this study will tell us whether or not suppressing them helps people. It's a really important study. So um, we have a lot going on there in the trial that, this is my last slide I wanna, well, my next last slide show. The uh, project in depth, uh, really important you hear about this. This is, this is an amazing study. It took us three years, four maybe, to get this whole thing working. But this is a VA NIH partnership where the VA is reaching out to Gulf War veterans to recruit them into this study. We're starting from the people that have done some of those surveys that have been going on for years now, particularly the surveys that were happening every five years after uh, the Gulf War. So uh, there are, uh, I think, 20 or 30,000 veterans that have participated in that study. Then there's several other survey studies um, that are out there that we're also been recruiting from and bringing, uh, doing a lot of review virtually and then bringing some people into VAs to, to dig a little deeper. 
if they're okay to go forward with a study. And this is this study has a very broad definition of Gulf oil industry. We really want to understand, understand it uh, in, its, in its true form. It's not too narrowly defined in terms of case definition. But if you're really looking good and you're willing to go forward, 50 lucky veterans will go to the uh, NIH, the hospital that's there on the NIH campus, it's just for research, and basically spend about two weeks in this facility having every known study ever designed and some that are brand, brand spanking new to uh, what's called a deep phenotyping, really getting into the deepest, deepest possible understanding of what's going on in those people. And then 25 healthy controls. And honestly, I think they're gonna be the hardest to recruit. So, um, but I do think this is so exciting. And then again, they'll be using this kind of computational modeling that I described that our group does to um, with even more information than we've ever been able to glean from our, what we thought were in-depth studies um, to really fill in those models and, and get us to the point of having uh, targeted therapies that are based on the best that science has to offer. And this is my final slide. This is just a slide that if you wanted to hit that link, I'll put it into the chat. In fact, I think I already did, but I'll do it again. Um, this is a way to just sign up on an easy kind of platform with about a 30 minute questionnaire about who you are, how you are, how sick you are, and that you're willing to be contacted for future studies. So it's, so it's a way for us to be allowed to reach out to you and tell you about the studies we have, keep you in the know with newsletters and things that we put out to you so that you're, you're well aware. This is, again, we use it not just for our studies, but for all this, any investigator that wants to, to help, uh, help us help them find their studies patients. Um, we put out the, as much as we possibly can to the people that are volunteering through this site. And so this is super helpful to us to be able to find you. There's so many uh, regulations that prevent us from being allowed to um, do that um, without your permission. So this is a way for you to give us permission. And that's about it. Thank you very much.